In this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the motor vessel Zim Kingston, en route from Busan, Korea to Vancouver, Canada, encounters heavy storm and winds, loses containers, and catches fire off the port of Victoria. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to What's Going On With Shipping. Today, we're joined by the CEO and captain himself, John Conrad from GCAP. And John, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Sal. Happy birthday, and uh, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks. All right. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, last night, I was watching your feed. You were doing a live feed on the events surrounding a vessel, the Zim Kingston. So let me pull up real quick for our audience here a quick little recap of what happened. So right now, the reports coming in is that the fire on board Zim Kingston appears to be contained. But if you go back to the original report, Zim Kingston had been sailing from Busan, Korea into Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. The ship had just completed a series of stops and routes throughout the Far East, uh, starting off in Taiwan, going through China and heading across the Pacific to Canada. Uh, vessel was running late because of storms in the Northern Pacific, a storm which, by the way, caused the Zim Kingston to lose several containers. We don't know the exact number yet, anywhere from about 40 to 60 containers. We're thinking we know they lost them in one of the forward stacks and one of the after stacks based on photographs that we've seen. When the ship arrived into the anchorage uh, off Victoria before heading up to Vancouver, she reported a fire on board. And uh, GCAPM has got great reporting on this. Mike Schuller over at GCAPM has been able to really put together a, a great thread here of information, images, uh, videos, uh, including communications between the Zim Kingston and the Canadian Coast Guard, which in a, an amazing thing, told the crew to abandon the vessel. I, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the craziness of, of them wanting them to, to, to abandon the vessel there in the anchorage. We know there's about, I've seen conflicting reports, how many are left on board, 10 to 5 left on board right now. But the ship is sitting here right now off the anchorage again, off Victoria. They've moved vessels that were in the anchorage with them out to, to get away from the smoke cloud. This is the anchorage right here. You'll see they're in Canadian waters. This is Zim Kingston right here. She is right there. Uh, you'll see alongside her several vessels. Uh, there's a Canadian Coast Guard vessel on standby right there. There's the Atlantic Raven. This vessel, the C-SPAN Raven, which was a tug, came out to provide some water suppression uh, to cool the hull but not spray water on the cargo, which we'll talk about why that wasn't done for, for this particular fire. And then uh, two other vessels, the Maersk Trader, which is an offshore supply vessel, and uh, the Maersk Tender which also an offshore supply vessel, but also part of this uh, um, uh, ocean cleanup program that is being run. So, John, I thought I'd get your, your assessment of what's going on right now, what has happened with, with Zim Kingston, and what, what are your thoughts on, on the events as they have unfolded so far? Right. So we know that the Zim Kingston uh, avoided or tried to avoid the storm that's coming in. There are two ultra low pressure systems going through um, and they're about to hit uh, L.A. Long Beach area, at least one of them. Um, and, you know, while the world is focused on Port of L.A. Long Beach, Mike Schuler, I believe the best maritime journalist in the world right now has been sending out these tweets warning of the storm. Um, this kind of when you have an emergency, this tunnel focus, uh, you lose situational awareness around you if you focus on one problem. So uh, you've been talking about it. I've been talking about it, that we have to widen our scope from the port of L.A. Ships are mobile and they can go to other ports and there. But there's no real leadership. There's no one at the Maritime Administration uh, reviewing these ships, looking at where they're going. Um, so this this uh, ship hit a storm. We don't know if they were pressured to kind of make their port uh, time. You know, they, these huge delays. It's first come, first serve because it's there's no real system to these ships coming in. So there's pressure on the captains to get in line for the discharge. They got too close to the storm, lost these containers. And um, similar to the Pearl Express earlier this year, which was a ship off of Sri Lanka that hit these storms, 
inside these containers is hazardous material, combustible material, explosive materials. And there's no really way of looking inside these containers to see if they are stored properly. So when a ship hits a big storm, it's beating into those waves over and over again. And it can dislodge material, this hazardous material inside the container. With the Pearl Express, some of this hazardous material leaked out into another container and ignited fire. We and it was actually uh, you, Sal, who broke that story, and the salvage team was watching your video, and and they were that's how they learned about um, this this you know how the Pearl Express um, caught fire, and, and you actually helped with that salvage. But that's that's what we are are facing here, and that's sort of why this ship happened and the storm continues to approach uh, long beach so it's a it's uh, the fire is contained but um as you know you're a firefighter you have to set a fire watch and there could be a reignition and you have all these other problems that we are facing right now yeah i thought it was i mean obviously you have several issues and, and you recap them really well and and again you know when the ship loses containers and we see that right there about the fourth stack back you can see the collapsed containers there and about a stack back from the from the house uh, and, and there's some good images out there which shows those collapsed containers. Once you lose those containers, obviously the the, the, the stow in them are going to get askew. I mean, I mean, you know, the problem we've seen repeatedly in containers, and, and there's a great story by Mike from a few years ago that recapped these these container accidents that have happened, these these loss of container ships. And a lot of times they hit rough weather, the cargo shifts, and within those containers, things just move. And even if they're packed great and, and and fantastically they're not designed to take you know 90 degree <laughs> flips in them so you know if you pack your computer in there and they got those lithium batteries and you crack the cell between the lithium uh between those those uh two plates on a lithium battery you're going to get a cascade power dump i mean you're just going to dump everything and and it, it's very difficult to fight fires on these things we've talked about this before small crews just because of the design and layout of these containers, it, it's almost impossible to set up your fire boundaries in some ways to get that water on there. And then you have the issue with, with this cargo, because one of the things that was identified was some of the material in the hazardous material containers. And it was it was this material right here, potassium, and I'm going to kill the, the last word here, amylaxinate. But a lot of potassium material doesn't react well with water. They do, does not like water at all. And matter of fact, one of the recommended processes for dealing with a fire dealing with potassium is to let it burn and and the problem with letting it burn on a ship is it, it could spread it could you know ignite the other containers i should also mention that this 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 material here is toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects which goes to you know one of the other decisions that that has to be made here is do you bring the ship into the port into the anchorage because, I mean, that's where the, the resources are to fight the fire. That's where your tugs are. That's where your salvage vessels are. That's where all that material is. But at the same time, when you bring that vessel in, you endanger the environment. I mean, you've got a big smoke plume coming off this vessel. It's coming ashore in uh, Victoria right now. You have a potential for a, a environmental disaster like you saw with Express Pearl. Uh, you have a potential for a salvage disaster like you saw with Ocasio in Mariches, or do you leave her offshore and just let her burn and, and, you know, take, take the risk. I, I think it's a really interesting debate that, that they have to go through. And I, I was wondering if you want to comment just a little bit about what you thought the approach here was by the Canadian officials, by Zim to, to bring the vessel in. Well, it's really interesting how, um, you know, where it located and kind of uh, comparing and contrasting this with, like, let's say the Bonham Richard fire the U.S. Navy experienced in San Diego last year. You know, w last night when I started my Twitter feed, it looked like this could be another Pearl Express. They were uh, large amounts of fires. The smoke was gaining momentum. And the Canadian Coast Guard made this kind of very unusual uh, it wasn't an order. It was a recommendation. They can't order the captain to abandon ship, but the, the cam said we are evacuating non-essential personnel. So you have the engine team, the deck team, um, deck team's captain, and they do the bridge and the navigation engine room does the engine room. And then you have the, the stewards department or cleaners and cooks. So usually you get those people off first, um, the non-essential personnel, but you don't want to evacuate the core engineers and the deck department because 
the deck department uh, may be needed to uh, jet help jettison containers, help uh, get a, a tug boat alongside. One of the reasons the Canadian Coast Guard wanted full abandonment is because when you're at anchor, the, the, the bow of the vessel tends to track into the wind, which means this smoke washes back right over the accommodations. And even if the wind changes, the ship will change. So you're getting all this toxic smoke in the accommodations. So that was primarily their concern and this hazardous material. But, um, you know, as a person of history, our greatest salvage master and, and kind of the grandfather of modern salvage, Admiral Ellsberg, talks about in Under the Red Hot Sun, he was the salvage master who kept the Suez Canal open during World War II. Um, and that was a wartime scenario, so it was different. But he was always berating the crews for abandoning too early because once you abandon, you lose engineering and then you lose water pressure on the uh, hoses and which is needed for this per, uh, um, uh, boundary cooling to, to cool the containers behind it so the fire doesn't spread and you lose the ability, you know, one way they could put a tug back aft and kind of pull that, pull that stern away from the smoke uh, pivot it on anchor to get the smoke going um, sideways. That's something you can only do if there's a crew on board. So it sounds like the master of this vessel decided to uh, disobey uh, a strong suggestion, which really in the age of criminalization of mariners, there's more blame being taken off of the office and shoreside support um, and being put on the captain. So this is really brave move on the captain. And, and it seems like it, it, it was the correct move in this situation. But I'm not a firefighter. What are your thoughts on uh, fighting these, these fires? Well, I, actually, I got two on that. And, and you know, when, if you go to the GCAP story, there's the actual audio uh, link there where you can actually hear them talking between the Canadian Coast Guard and the captain. I, th I think there's two issues at play. Number one, there's also a salvage issue. If you've been in the vessel, there's a salvage issue that goes in because there's no the vessel's no longer under command and and so it, it opens up a free salvage operation there without the crew on board but i think you're exactly right i think one of the things you want to be able to do is 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 two things maneuver the vessel to put the wind on the beams so that this fire is not spreading down not only are you bring in the smoke aft when you're when you're pointing into the wind but you're bringing the fire aft and what you want to do is get that that uh wind coming perpendicular to the ship so that it, you're trying to limit the amount of heat and fire spreading down. I mean, obviously the issue you have here, you can see it right here, this fire in the stacks, that stack has collapsed right there. What you don't want to do is these other containers forward and aft start popping in, in, into flames. And so you want to limit it as much as you can. So if you can get to the wind, now we know she's anchored, she's got the anchor down, so she's already you know holding ground right there. So she can prevent that. She's also got other containers that collapse. So there's a potential for more fire on board this vessel. And I agree. I, the other issue there is the pumps. You know, if, once you do start fighting fire, you're going to start putting water on this vessel and, and you need to get that water off. Again, for every gallon of water you put on a fire, you got to get a gallon off the ship or else you're sinking. All you're doing is sinking the vessel at that point. And there has to be. We know that the, the C-SPAN tug came in and started doing some cooling on the hull. So they were spraying onto the hull to, to stop that. Again, one of the big problems you have with fire on a ship is it radiates through the metal. And so you got to cool that metal down or else you're going to have it and you're going to have the distortion of it. Again, go back to that image of Express Pearl, which just absolutely just collapsed into itself. I mean, the entire vessel just just almost like melted at its position. And, and I do. I, I wonder why the Canadian Coast Guard made that decision to, to, to abandon the vessel, because, again, you lose the footing. You lose the power of the vessel. You lose any sort of assistance you can get from the vessel at all. And I understand the desire to, to, to protect the crew, but I mean, they can get into the interior of the vessel, shut compartments, you know, and, and it, while it won't be airtight by any means, it, it's still, you're pretty far away from the fire at that point. This is again, a vessel that, that carries about 4,500 containers on board. I think she's a little over 250 meters in length. So you've got a good distance between you and the fire. And, and I think, I think it's a questionable decision. Again, I hate to second guess the Canadian Coast Guard, but I think if you abandon the vessel, you lose a foothold and you lose so many assets you have if you remain on board. Well, that's, that's really interesting. And I, and I want to talk about the federal response and you know more about the Canadian Coast Guard than I do, but you know, what we learned from Admiral Ellsberg is you really need assets on the location nearby. And what really, I believe, saved this vessel is it was so close to Seattle, Tacoma, Vancouver, 
There are major um, uh, oil tankers that come in from Valdez and then go up through the Straits of Juan de Fuca, where this is, up into the Puget Sound. Um, so you have these massive tugboats that are equipped to fight tanker fires and handle oil spills in this area. But, um, you know, traditionally, before the Exxon Valdez really changed those requirements, you had Navy salvage tugs, Navy fire boats, Navy teams all throughout the country and around the world that could respond to this equipment. Now, instead of that, you have uh, salvage companies, and even the U.S. Navy has outsourced their salvage to a foreign uh, multinational huge conglomerate in the Netherlands uh, does most of the Navy salvage. So that's the Navy. Well, one thing you need is assets in the area and assets that have familiarity with this uh, equipment. So, uh, you know, are the firefighters trained in handling container ship fires? So now what we were lucky is these huge Maersk vessels were nearby and tugs were nearby. And these are merchant mariners who, if this was not the Coast Guard who came and rescued the ship, they were directing some of the traffic, but you had merchant mariners on scene and then they were in communication with the salvage team ashore. So you have commercial salvers, uh, which are you know, usually filled with the biggest salvage operation in America is Schmidt Salvage. The head of Schmidt Salvage Americas is a former uh, ship captain and you have ship engineers and naval architects. So this is merchant mariners helping each other, but they need those supplies. And we were very lucky that this MERS cleanup ship and the, and the Canadian Coast Guard cutter was able, and these tugboats were able to get in and get the water. Now that's from the Navy does not have the supplies. The salvage companies have kind of pre-positioned and they have to airlift in supplies. So the salvage company usually doesn't get there till six to 12 hours later. Um, you know, they'll try to organize these local assets, but this is something the federal government, and the Navy should have. They've sold off all of this equipment in order to fund their mega ships, the carriers and the Zumwalt class. And then we have the issue of the Coast Guard. Now, um, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the Canadian Coast Guard, but this is in the Straits of Juan de Fuca, right between Canada and America. So I'll talk about the American Coast Guard a little bit. Um, they used to have a saying in the American Coast Guard, you have to go out, but you don't have to return. Um, that was that was what Coast Guard people like Mario Vitone, a Coast Guard rescue swimmer, lived by. Um, it wasn't an official motto, but it was what everyone heard. Then Admiral Papp came in a few years ago, uh, two commandants ago, and he said, "We're too many Coast Guard men are losing their lives. We want zero fatalities in the Coast Guard. Well, how do you achieve zero fatalities? You um, limit your exposure risk. Um, you limit the, the ability of people to go out there. Uh, you cut back in the amount of equipment for the dangerous jobs. So they started getting rid of, um, you know, these small rescue boats and the salvage equipment. Uh, the most dangerous area on the West Coast is Point Conception. They closed the boat station at Point Conception decades ago. Um, and they started removing these assets uh, from the area. And then when Pap came in, he said, we are going to zero fatalities and actually issued an order saying, we will not fight ship fires. The Coast Guard will not fight ship fires and requiring as part of the insurance that ships coming in have commercial um, contracts with salvage teams to do these ship fires. So, you know, you have then the Navy pulling back equipment and supplies, um, and then you had the Maritime Administration, MARAD, which should be taking a leadership stance, but we had the biggest cr ship crisis in decades. They haven't sent anyone out to the Port of Long Beach. I highly doubt they're sending anyone out to this incident. Um, so there's no real leadership. The Navy doesn't have the supplies and the Coast Guard has really pulled back. And then you have the fact that this is between Canada and the United States. So I'll let you talk a little bit about the Canadian Coast Guard. No, I, I think you hit on a couple of things there. Canadian Coast Guard is, is a little different than the U.S. Coast Guard in its structure. It's a civilian agency. It's not a military agency. So it, it kind of operates very similar to the military sea lift command in that the uh, uh, mariner, <laughs> excuse me, the mariners who crew it are civilians. They have civilian licenses. There's a, a hierarchy structure into it. But again, the Canadian Coast Guard 
has a much different mission. It's really interesting where this, like you said, where this vessel is, it's actually sandwiched between two major naval bases. Eskimoalt, which is the largest West Coast Canadian Navy base, is right here. It's literally within within sight of this uh, vessel. And then with Seattle Tacoma area is is also right here. You have so many large vessels in this. There's a massive anchorage. There are four large container ships right now sitting here in this anchorage, waiting to get in the Seattle Tacoma area. If you come up to the area off of uh, uh, Vancouver, you see massive anchorages. There's a massive bulker anchorage right here uh, where Vancouver has vessels just standing by waiting to get loaded here. And and I think one of the things that we're talking about Navy that decision would would be island is there too one of yep. our biggest uh, uh, well, air bases and and actually the U.S. Navy has two vessels sitting here right here which are escort vessels for nuclear ballistic missile submarines that have some limited firefighting capability on board that can be used but I, I think you go back and you mentioned the Bonham Richard and I think it's a very interesting parallel there because that report just came out I just did a podcast with a group of guys on the bilge pumps about it and I'm doing a video on that on that soon. But one of the things that was amazing is you lost a major naval vessel in a U.S. port. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is, is, is this storm that, that, that hit the Zim Kingston is heading down the coast. You've got over half a million containers afloat right now off the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. Uh, are those vessels going to remain? Is, is, is Marine Exchange of Southern California and U.S. Coast Guard Southwest going to order those vessels out of the anchorage? Last time they did a high wind event, they didn't. And we wound up with a pipeline cracked that leaked nine months later, if they do head out, are we going to have the potential for a loss of containers? We last year, I mean, we both know how many containers were lost last year. It was a record year, a number of containers being lost. ONE Opus coming back in to, uh, Apis, excuse me, coming back in was, you know, amazingly that ship did not catch fire. As many containers that it lost, you would think that that was a potential right there. And, and again, these vessels are extremely high risk because should a fire happen on board it's very difficult to do you know when you fight a fire and especially a shipboard fire you have to get to the base of the fire you have to get to the seat of the fire you can't do that in a container ship it's, it's almost impossible especially if it's in the interior stacks if it's packed in there you can't open doors on a lot of containers because of the way they they're so tight together and basically you you basically either have to just wet them down and pray in this case you couldn't do that you had to let this burn out and you know, we've seen issues where ships like Express Pearl, for example, was unable to get into ports to offload hazardous material they knew was leaking. They knew the ship was a danger. They knew it was a floating time bomb waiting to happen. And they got pushed off by Oman. They got pushed off by India. Then they arrived at Sri Lanka. And now you have a, a, a environmental disaster. I mean, if, if it looks like Zim Kingston right now is, is, is under control, that's the reports we're getting right now. But again, so did Express Pearl. I remember I go back to that story that Express Pearl looked like it had its fire under control. And then a day or two later, it bloomed back up again. Uh, I mean, this ship has got to get pier side and you got to start getting boxes off of it now. I, I mean, you know, th that's the other danger you have now. Are they willing to bring this ship into Vancouver and start offloading it? Because I got to imagine toxic smoke and air in downtown Vancouver is not going to be well received. You know, ideally, we should have some sort of facilities out to go out and start taking boxes off this vessel, floating that, you know, uh, you know, something like that. And we do have vessels like that. There are two of them sitting in Alameda right now. I talked about not too long ago, these ready reserve force vessels that can go out and start plucking containers off this, you know, but it's hard to do that at anchor. Let me be clear. It's, it's a difficult thing. It's a slow process. But you would love to start getting those containers, especially off those stacks that are close to the fire right now. And start, you know, getting, you know, you know, if you can't put the fire out, put the move the fuel away from it. Don't give it any more fuel. You know, that's that that's forestry fire. You know, when you, when you have a forest fire, what do you do? If you can't put the forest fire out, you may you do a control burn around the area so that once it hits the, the the black zone, it's it dies. It runs out of fuel to fight the fire. And it's the same thing in a container fire. The problem is this thing has a load of fuel. I mean, containers are just naturally heavy fuel loads. And, and, and that heat radiates and the danger you have to have now is fire below deck in one of those containers below deck. Different types of fire, right? Class A, class B, yep. class C, class D. Each container is you have to fight with different methods. Is that right? It, well, exactly. Well, you may have to fight different methods in just one container because you know as well as I do, there could be multiple, um, you know, different elements in there. If you put a car inside one of these containers, you can have all those fires at the same time. It's a hybrid car. It's got battery power. It's got a magnesium engine block. Uh, you know, it, it, it can have all those elements right there that have 
a fire. And, and, and again, it just makes this worse because every one of those containers, that Lego block, can have a, a different way you have to fight that fire. And again, what's the size of the Zim uh, Kingston crew? I mean, probably 20, 25 uh, tops on board. And, and so, I mean, you have very limited firefighting capability to begin with to, to, to be able to put this out. So, you know, we, uh, for uh, for ballistic missiles, we have a NORAD that's kind of overseeing this and, and uh, you know, the Air Force and the, you know, FAA has uh, air traffic control. Um, you know, uh, ostensibly we have the U.S. Maritime Administration, which, uh, you know, is supposed to be a, a commandant of the U.S. Merchant Service, three-star admiral. Uh, instead, we're getting a one-star Navy admiral who is a flag officer while, you know, this, the Navy was divesting themselves of this salvage equipment uh, 20 years ago. So we're getting someone into this slot who is participating. I don't know how, how involved she was, but was there in the Pentagon with a star on her shoulder while we were getting rid of this equipment that led to the Bonar Merchant fire. So, so is, who's overlooking all this stuff? You said uh, Marine Exchange is Southern California, but that's, that's a local. Uh, that, that's not like NORAD or um, FA, uh, air traffic control that, you know, air traffic control is local, but they're all connected and coordinated. And there's a coordination center. We have a rescue coordination center here but they don't necessarily have mariners involved. And as we said before, the Coast Guard got away under Admiral Papa firefighting. So what, you know, who, who determines this stuff? Well, I, you know, I agree with you. I had a very interesting conversation with somebody at, at, at maritime administration. Uh, I, I was asked a question. It was kind of an informal one. So I, I can't say with who or what, but, you know, the, asking specifically about the situation off Southern California and, and basically what this person from the maritime administration told me, it's really not our issue. I, I mean, this is, you know, this is, the Federal Maritime Commission. It has to do with international shipping. It really is 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 not their issue. And, and again, I I, I 100 disagree with that. They're in charge of the U.S. domestic maritime infrastructure, and it doesn't matter if it's an international ship coming in or not. This is them, and, and they should be working hand in hand with the Coast Guard, with the Federal Maritime Agencies. You know, I I, I had that same issue that you made. I think it was last night. You were talking about how the head of the FAA is a pilot. And somebody told me, well, you know, the head of the Maritime Administration doesn't need to be a ship cap, doesn't need to be a chief engineer. It really doesn't because 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 the FAA has so many more regulatory issues associated with it. And, and again, I think that is completely wrong. Now, Admiral Phillips could be the best maritime administrator in history because there's really no track record for success for maritime administrators. You know, we've had some great experience. People come in and been duds. We've had people with very little experience come in and be OK. I, I would argue we haven't really had the great maritime administrator. You got to go back to. Admiral Land, you know, back in in, in the Maritime Commission, wow. that's, but that's pulling out of history there. Yeah, I know, but 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 I mean, this situation is. I mean, again, if this if this, if this low pressure area, and again, it's heading down the coast, and and again, you know, I, I made fun of Mike Scholler a couple of days ago. I called him a weather nerd because he he put this thing up and he was talking about this. Put this up several times. I yeah, mean, and he's exactly right. And I you know I, I said no apologize to us, man. You were dead on. This is exactly right. We actually had a bet on who's going to be the first one to lose containers. We both lost it. We had different lines, but but still. We knew it was going to start happening because because it does. I mean, and let's be clear, this does happen. We see containers being lost every year. That's a fairly typical event we see. But the problem you have right now is it's this system is on such steroids. We're pumping gear and 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 equipment across at such high rates that a lot of things are being slacked. You know, the the, the interior loads of containers are probably not being stowed the way they need to be. Not 100 percent sure lashings are being done, particularly on those exterior containers to do it. We also, you know, starting to learn that that wind and weather have unique effects on these container ships, you know, and, and this twisting motion that they they experience is a lot different. And as you, you know, one of the things that, that, that we don't talk about very much, but it has happened, is the classification societies have allowed these container ships to carry more containers than they were originally designed for. They're able to stack a little bit higher now than they previously did. And even though we're only talking about one or two, maybe maybe stacks on, you know, containers on top of the stacks, that adds a new motion to these vessels. And as, con as container ship companies route these vessels into this weather, and they do, and that's the issue. We know that. We know this for a fact that, you know, they don't want the, 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 the demerge charges of being late. They, they have got to get on that berth on time because there's too many ships waiting to come in behind them. And if they miss that dock, then you create that butterfly effect. And now they can't get in. And not just they can't get in, but other ships can't get in. 
and it throws their whole schedule off again you know i come back to the zim schedule this is a tight tight schedule they have where they need to be on birth and they're already late they're already two days late they were supposed to arrive on 20 october they arrived 22 october off vancouver or, i mean off off the coast and then they're at the anchorage on 23 october so they're already late they already know they're late and we've seen what happens when sh when shipping companies push vessels to maintain their schedule i go back to el faro and the loss of that vessel which was clearly done by the firm toad that was pushing them to maintain their schedule and the ship's master who's ultimately responsible for everything decided to take a risk and try to push the vessel through a, a situation he shouldn't have pushed them through and then a series of events took place that resulted in the loss of the vessel and the crew and it's the same thing here you know you're taking a risk how many ships went through this storm and didn't lose containers i dozens probably dozens but the problem is when one does it you can have this effect and again you know the fact that this vessel looks like this and doesn't you know look like this is is the important thing because i think that and again we're not out of the woods yet because you know one of the things about container ship fires is just when you think they're out they start back up again so john what do you think what do you think for for the situation that we're facing now long term obviously you know we've got the issue of southern california big push to get more container ships up into oakland and and use more of these 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 ports but you know we're coming into winter time, and so you know everyone who thinks winter in the North Atlantic is bad has never sailed winter in the North Pacific, which is which yeah. is hor horrific. I mean, it is it is just horrific the North Pacific in, in weather time. I mean, you got that. You got I've been there in a thousand foot tanker coming down from uh, Vancouver, uh, Alaska, and uh, man, I was like, this this ship is too small. And then you look at those uh, deadliest catch boats, and you're like. Phew. 100 foot boats one tenth the size of the ship i was on and you're like, how do these guys do it well and, and, and you can see it right here i mean uh, i mean you see them already diverting already i mean you know the, the the great circle again you know you know everyone in the world stop looking at flat maps i hate looking at flat maps look at the globe because the shortest distance between east asia and the west coast of the united states takes you through the bering sea and the aleutians you know because that's the that's the shortest route and and let me tell you be clear that short route is horrific route because it is it is just everything you said you know just watch the, the deadliest catch you know and they're sailing through that kind of stuff you can see where vessels are not sailing right now because again that weather they're doing some evasion but if you push south which is clear weather you know if you go north of the hawaiian islands that's a longer route that's adding time to your voyage and what's amazing right now is ships are still pushing you would think wait a minute there's 70 ships off la long beach why are you fast steaming why are you pushing to get in off Southern California? Well, that's because those 70 ships, it depends on the terminal. It depends on the berth. Some vessels, some berths are moving faster than others. And they want to get there because they want to get the next ships moving. And, and there's a perception right now that if you don't get your ships to the port right now, they're not going to be able to get offloaded this, in time. And this tunnel focus, there's a presidential pressure on Long Beach LA to, to fix things. So everyone's focused on this and they're not seeing the consequences um uh, ross kennedy who's huntsman a uh, man integrated yep. on twitter just excellent uh work he he said uh in a tweet yesterday influencer media has latched on to the supply chain crisis some have been discussing with expert specificity for 20 months so you have uh mike Schuler, who's been warning and warning and warning about this storm coming in and affecting this this uh, crisis and no one pays attention to it and then um scott adams the creator of dilbert comes up with this suggestion Let's bring pickup trucks in to <laughs> unload these containers, which he got a lot of flag from, uh, you know, I think there's there's a there's a good possibility and we could get into short sea shipping. I don't think it's a horrible idea, but um, he gets hundreds of thousands of views while the expert Mike Schuler gets, you know, I think a, a dozen <laughs> likes on a real major storm that's coming in. So that's, we got the Dilbertization of the supply chain crisis. And that's who uh, the influencers, the media, the congressmen, because of this vacuum of a lack of leadership, no Marad uh, vacuum. And so these influencers come out with some of these crazy ideas and you get this conspiracy theories too, uh, which kind of, and everyone focuses and tries to work on that. And it, it pulls the attention away from the major things like the storms. Cause they're not, I mean, if I was the port by, if I was married, I would have Mike Schuler on speed dial. Um, that's not a creation anymore. And then you also have unattended effects of good people. One of the, you know, uh, 
absolute people I love in this crisis is Ryan uh, Peterson of yeah. Flexport. He went down and he took a three hour tour of the, the, of the docks. He got a taco truck out for the Mariners and the truck drivers and everyone in the port to listen to their concerns. And he came out with this list of five things that need to be done. And then the mayor of Long Beach comes in and says, one of them was let's stack the change fire. fire five. Step number one. But, but, no one's listening to Mike Schuler here. So I love this idea and, and Ryan Peterson's enthusiasm, but they got to bring in the maritime expert because what's the first thing ports typically do when you have a mega storm coming in, they de-stack the containers. Yep. Um, so one at a time where we should be lowering the stacks for this storm, you have an executive emergency order based off a tweet from Ryan Peterson, which I, I think is great. And I love his ideas, but we're, because we're focused on the port, we're not focused on the ships. Who's who has the experience of stacking containers high in high weather situations? It's the ship captains, and we have you know no one's my my phone is not ringing off the hook like uh, Scott, uh, <laughs> like uh, the Dilbert creator or Ryan Peterson, right? Your I don't think your phone is no, it, it's not. No, you, you're exactly right. I mean, I gotta agree with you. You know that Scott Adams thing. You know, let's use pickup trucks to do it. It's like all right, Scott. I mean, I mean, it sounds great. You know, let's but Uber the this. Amount of views he gets versus oh, I know. The expert Mike Schuler gets is well, and is I think insane. That's and I think the, the differential yep. between the expertise and this influencer is what Ross Kennedy he's talking about well i think that's right and ross you know ross came out with this idea which was really more expensive extensive than what ryan did and i i've kind of built on that because i talked a little bit about the short sea shipping aspect about that about using the maritime administration aspects about using some vessels for that and you know i got some flack back it's like well that's not going to do it now it's like you can't there's no one solution to this you have to use a series of small solutions that start knocking down this problem, but also looking at the long term. And this is my issue I have with the Maritime Administration. You're going to get me going. So I'm going to talk about the Maritime Administration right now and, and talk about this. When they sit there and say, it's not our problem, it's like, it's exactly your problem. And you need to be involved in it because one thing you need federal coordination, you need someone to coordinate this. The Port of LA is the landlord for seven terminals. That's it. That's all Gene Soroka does. He's a landlord. That's all he does. He has no power over the terminal. Same thing in Long Beach. You have to get someone who can influence them with federal and up in government Victoria, this coast guard made the decision to abandon all ships and he didn't they didn't have the authority to do that and no and then the, the ship didn't do it in a legal um in a really bind there where do i listen to the coast guard and potentially go to jail because the coast guard can yep. arrest um i don't know about the canadian coast Guard, or do i do what's right for my vessel and the environment and the people luckily he made the right choice but it's hard. The Canadian Coast Guard can arrest you, but they're the most polite people who do arrest you. It's the, it's the thing about the Canadians. But but you're right. I, I mean, you need some sort of coordination and oversight. And, and again, we I go back to the January and say, again, that Mike was on perfectly identifying the Danit as one of the key vessels that did this. Uh, you know, and, and again, Maritime Exchange, U.S. Coast Guard Southwest did not tell these vessels to up their anchor and get the heck out of the anchorage in a high wind event. And not only do they tell them not to do that, at least the ones close to the pipeline, but then they supposedly have this great system to monitor the anchorage and nobody saw these ships drag across the anchorage across the pipeline to catch it. And again, we should be looking at this long term. How are we going to fix this in the future? This is not going to, you know, everyone keeps talking about when's this going to end, when's this going to end. I am not sure when this ends, because I think one of the things we're seeing is the, the carriers, the big container companies, the nine big ones, plus Zim, have all learned that, listen, we, we figured out how to make profit now. And I think now we've got it figured out to a bit. Sit at and, anchor, make a lot of money. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's that's exactly why they keep sending. I mean, there's no reason to send ships across the Pacific right now. There's not. They, they could just sit there in, in, in East Asia and wait, but they're not. They keep coming. And again, which means that we've got these dangers in the North Pacific this, this winter time. And we have to take control of our waters. I, I hate to say it, but we really do. How do we put together these uh, personnel? You suggested the book Freedom's Forge about World War II and, and the dollar a day men of, of Knutson and some of these others where they brought together this expert panel and just pay these guys a dollar a day. That seems like something that we could use here because 
Scott Adams and I, I love Dilbert. That's not solving it. And Ryan Peterson's very close on track and he's got these five points, which I love, but you know, he potentially missing something, you know, um, because well, he's kind of it, working on his own. Right. And Ryan's looking at it from a freight forward standpoint too. I mean, you know, his, his idea, for example, is a short rail, you know, let's rail things a hundred miles. That's not going to work with the railroads. I can say that right now, the rails are not going to do that because that's not what's in their best interest. But then again, that's where you need coordination and you need to bring people in from outside give them some sort of authority. You know, a port liaison is not it. Let me be clear, because a port liaison has no power whatsoever. You know, John Picari, who's, who's, who's been appointed as port liaison, it doesn't, really doesn't have much power. Where is the Secretary of Transportation? You know, to me, I, I keep going back to this, tri uh, this, this, this quartet that it should be the head of the FAA, the head of the rail administration, the head of the highway administration, and the head of the maritime administration. At, at Ryan's taco truck. They, well, four of them should be there trying to say, okay, what do we need to do? What, what, what can we do? And, and listen, I'm not one for talking about the federal government can solve your problems because I'm not, I, I understand, you know, we're from the federal government. We're here to help is not the thing everyone wants to hear. But one of the things that we've seen happen repeatedly, I got, I got a discussion, you know, with a wall street uh, journal art, uh, uh, author the other day about this is is how the carriers pitted the east coast ports against each other to outbuild each other to accommodate their new vessels when there should have been some sort of federal coordination over that instead of forcing the citizens of new york new jersey to pay to lift the bayonne bridge you know because because Duner uh, uh from what's the truck which which we were both on showing uh photos i have not been on what the truck yet. i've, I've not oh, been on what the truck yet Duner, so you, you have salon, but he showed a picture of all the empty docks in Boston that were that were, but that this this goes back. The Navy got rid of the salvage and the work boats in order and the tugboats in order to fund these mega expensive Zumwalt and 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 carrier class. Yep. And that's what we're doing at the ports. We're getting rid of a lot of these smaller ports and the subsea sh short sea shipping in order to fund these mega ports. Um, and it doesn't and work. You see that happen with Oakland. Oakland shot themselves in the foot. I mean, the, the, the public relations guy of Oakland came out the other day and basically apologized for what happened earlier last year in, 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 in their issue with labor and the fact that ships were delayed in Oakland when they didn't need to be delayed. And what what would the big carries do? We don't need Oakland. You know, we're just going to go to L.A. and Long Beach. It's easier. It's, you know, if I'm a ship company, I'd rather go to one port and offload everything than go to multiple ports and offload. I got to pay for pilots. I got to pay for, you know, dockage. I got to pay for all these things. I much rather go in one port and not. And, and if everyone doesn't believe that New York, New Jersey and Savannah are becoming the two main ports on the East Coast, they're mistaking Charleston, Virginia, uh, Florida, all need to be concerned about that. They are concerned, concerned about it. about the sucking of it. Who's paying for these ports, these mega yep. ships, uh, to give the top carriers a kind of uh, cartels, really, uh, yep. these cartels, um, you know, exclusive rights? Yeah, I mean, I saw the report from the Port of Virginia saying, you know, listen, we've had a bigger year than ever before. It's like, you're not growing as fast as Savannah's growing. <laughs> Let's be clear about that. You're growing, but not as fast. And that's what scares them because Savannah is going to become that major hub. It's going to become the L.A. and Long Beach. And if you look at the delays at, at Savannah versus L.A. and Long Beach, they're actually worse. LA, Savannah actually, by proportion, by percentage, has a bigger log jam off its port than L.A. and Long Beach. But that's because Savannah is a much smaller port right now. It doesn't handle the, the 18 million containers a year that, that Savannah does. But it has that potential, I would argue. And, and again, what happens when we have a disaster in these ports? L.A. and Long Beach, I would argue, is fairly well set in terms of fire prevention, fireboats, things like that to do it. But what we've seen is the control of the anchorage is, is not well maintained. That's obvious from the dragging incident. So we don't have controls. We have a highly packed area off there that drift area is is a, a disaster so waiting we, to happen the, when we went to maritime college we went to new york to the, the maritime together you know not at the same time at the same school they said the the laws of today are written in the blood of mariners who go in the past we, we had a storm last year they dragged anchor hit a pipeline and now we're not evacuating the port it, it seems we're not learning these lessons right no, it, it doesn't. The Pearl Express hit a heavy weather and, you know, we could have got the salvage teams on station. We could have got the Navy assets to meet them at port, but we're not, we didn't learn the lessons from the Pearl Express. We're, these are, I, I, I go, I go back to this issue that number one, and, and, and I, I go back to number one, the Coast Guard is just overwhelmed in the missions they have 11 primary missions they have and controlling commercial shipping is one that unfortunately is not as high on the list as 
others. It just isn't. And, 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 and they may not say that publicly, but it's true. It's just that it, it's that true. It, it, that's the case. If you go to a lot of they other countries privately to you and me and offer right. record discussions, right? But if you go to other countries, they have a much level, you know, there's a minister of shipping, you know, for, we don't have a minister of shipping. We don't have a secretary of shipping. We don't even have an undersecretary of shipping. You know, we, we don't, we did. I mean, basically if you go back to the early fifties, sixties, we did, but then we split the, the maritime administration, the federal maritime commission. We took, you know, we took the regulatory and and the administration aspect and split it in half. And, and, you know, that's a problem in my opinion, because the only country that sends military officers to the UN to debate shipping, right? Right. And, 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 and that, that is strange. And, and, you know, when you go, when you're from the U S coast guard, how much experience do you have with commercial shipping? You don't have a lot. Again, if you have a storm coming into this area, which there is, I mean, we know there's a storm coming into this area. Why are these what ships? We forgot. We couldn't find the name super bomb, bomb storm. There's something. I forget what, what it's, it's called. Too. It, it, here. You have to get Mike on it, but you know, why are these ships not sorting? Why are they, you know, then the U S Navy has that plan when the hurricanes come in, man, the ships run out of Norfolk. They run out of San Diego, you know, you get on that storm evasion plan. Who's giving a storm evasion play? Because let me be clear, none of these guys want to get too far away from the docks because once that dock they opens, lose they want their line. Yeah, you they, know, these are the questions they they they're, 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 they don't we don't have the answers to. Right. And, and that needs to be done because the worst case scenario is this off the port of L.A. and Long Beach. That I, I mean, this is you know, this is off. I mean, this is terrible for Victoria. It's terrible for the British Columbia. It, I mean, and fortunately, this is a four thousand two hundred something TEU vessel. It's not one of the big 12,000, 15,000 box vessels, because if that happens off the coast, and let me be clear, we had a couple of instances not too long ago where this happened. NYK Daedalus off of uh, Oakland caught fire, had to be brought in. President Eisenhower had a, an engine room fire, had to be brought into LA. Uh, when it went, when it drift, almost went ashore in Santa Barbara, did video on that one, did video on both of those. You know, that was so close to being a disaster. You know, with that ship coming ashore all the time, we lose an average of one ship a yep. week in, in good years. We're talking big ships and this you mag all the time and you magnify it when you bring a lot of ships together in a close environment, especially in the drift zone, the anchorage where the crews, I guarantee, are not as vigilant as they would be somewhere else because hey we're off the coast of california we're just going to drift here don't give the the crews basic human rights as frank coles and human rights at sea and see if a waves continue and the reefs on board ships and all these other issues right these ships are, have been at sea now they're just, they just did, are going through the roof sound just just they just did an atlantic crossing which is going to take them two weeks at least to go if not three weeks which is stressful right so they're three weeks across i mean fresh food and 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 you know basic things are running out at that point yeah they got food on board but it's the end of their voyage you know milk is 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 is, is, is nuclear milk at this point it's you know all that kind of stuff you know and, and, and you're losing basic rights some of these guys are sailing off the coast they don't have internet they don't have wi-fi they don't have anything and and you know it, the worst thing in the world is to be on a ship see land and you can't touch it because again the magic wand what would be the one thing that you would wave and do right now the one thing I would I would do right now, I would number one is is I would start getting with the carriers to slow down this 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 process. I, I mean, stacking these vessels off here is a disaster. I would get a air traffic control I mean, think, type. Think bigger. What was the bigger thing? Oh, the biggest. I mean, the biggest thing I would do right now is is appoint a shipping minister, a a a, a deputy secretary of shipping right now. I mean that that's what I would do on a government side. And understand I'd have I, them wear the uniform and, and and take up their rightful seat at the joint. Re, you know, yeah. section 13 of the US Merchant Marine Act of 1936, which was amended in 1938, created the US Maritime Service. You know, put back in the US Maritime Service. Number one, you know, let them do the credentialing for US merchant mariners. Uh, put all merchant mariners under the maritime service. They don't have to salute and get clean shaven and everything like that, but you put them under, under the maritime service, just like the U.S. Public Health provide Service. Them with free firefighting training, free hazmat training, free training in exchange for when they, there's a war that they are- Veteran benefits. You can put veteran, they don't need to get a DD-214 because they're not in the Department of Defense anymore. They're in, they're in the maritime service. This is what was supposed to be done at the end of World War II for the merchant mariners who sailed, but instead got screwed and they didn't get veterans benefits until 1988. So almost 40 years after the fact, but what the maritime service could do is they could take over the credentialing. They could take over all those elements from the U S coast guard. They could take over the VTS systems, the vessel traffic uh, systems, much like the FAA runs them and get control over our no anchorages. Uh, 
representation and IMO representation, flag representation. They can get with the big flag, uh, you know, Panama, Liberia and Marshall Islands, get that under control. And more importantly, start initiating proposals for what we should be doing in the future that, you know, we're, I, I mentioned this Wall Street, in Wall Street Bank. I love Admiral Busby, our last maritime administrator, but I, I was constantly on him. You got to talk to these hedge funds, these derivatives, these fintechs. That's why I love Ryan Peterson, because he understands these and, and Craig Fuller at Freight Waves. These guys are raising serious amounts of money. I was just on, I, I did a, a spot on Freight Waves with uh, Steve Ferrer on his B2B. And one of the things right. I mentioned is we got a little historical there. I talked about the fact that the, the container was designed by Malcolm McLean. And the genesis of the container was when he had to take a load of cotton up to the uh, freight terminal up at Red Hook up in Brooklyn. And he was sitting on a long line waiting to, 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 to you know, to, to offload his, his container, or not his container, but his, his cotton bales. And it just, he said it, it shouldn't have happened. So he radically redesigned the way we move cargo. Right now, there may be a guy sitting, a guy or woman sitting there in the line. failed until the U.S. Navy, you know, used it, adopted it for yep. the Vietnam War, right? So That's right. That's Mark Levinson the in, in, in the box. He used to sell off these logistics. The Army just sold off all of their container uh, and uh, landing craft. But right now, in the line at L.A. and Long Beach could be the guy who, or a woman who has the next great idea. And the question is, will he be able or he or she be able to invest that in the United States and enact that? You know, maybe it's that modular container that comes apart that can be used on short sea shipping. Maybe it's it's something we hadn't even thought about because, again, the great idea for shipping didn't come from shipping. It came from a truck driver. And but what I worry about is we don't have the environment where someone who comes up with that idea can implement it in the United States. Instead, they're going to go overseas and this will be an innovation that's done by somebody else and will be left behind. We're seeing it right now with propulsion on vessels with IMO 2050 looming on the horizon. Who's, you know, who's coming up with the new propulsion ideas, you know, the ammonia fuel, the, the, the e ethanol, you know, who, who's doing it? It's not us. It's not going to be us. Unfortunately, it's going to be somebody overseas doing that. And one of the things we've always been able to do is use technology to our advantage. John, we're running up a time. I got we went too long already and everything. So my magic wand, really quick. Go ahead. I had one thing. I would get you. I would get uh, Ross Kennedy Huntsman at Twitter. I would get Ryan Peterson, and I would send you to the Joe Rogan Show because, <laughs> and uh, seriously, that that one person who's got that tr that truck driver who's got that idea, he's he doesn't know about ships. He doesn't know about the transportation logistics. And the media, uh, Joe Rogan influences policy. Uh, you know, senators uh, watch that and 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 do it. And we've got this major sea blindness. And uh, you know, get Mike well, Schiller to do this this weather maps. Uh, you know, we need a big. You know, that's the uh, Dilbert is uh, horrible, but that's where the views are. So we got to go. We got to go. And and Joe Rogan, man. It's, ships are blowing up. There's fire. There's explosions. There's pipeline. There's oil. Come on, Joe. Get Sal and uh, Ryan and uh, Huntsman on on your show. I will. I will say that one of the best one of the best things, if you can call the the silver lining, what's going on is so much more attention to shipping and supply chain. I, I mean, kind of the wrong attention, right? I well, it is. But I mean, you, even you admit that G Cabin has gotten its its its, its increased. You know, visibility. Freight waves has increased there, and you know, he, you know. What Craig's trying to do is become the, the Bloomberg of freight. He's doing a great job with that, I think. You know, and 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 guys like Ryan Peterson out there and 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 Ross, you know, they're trying to get ideas. The ideas, you know, that's and that's the killer thing is, and Mike is it, you're exactly right, deserves all the credit. You know, the the ideas are out fantastic. there. The fork fantastic. He is. And 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 the, the ideas are out there. The problem is, are they getting to where they need to go? You know, again, how is it that we don't have somebody at the Maritime Administration who's just channeling all this just looking at all these these because concepts we don't have a joe rogan or a, yep. a, a influencer maybe we got a, a ross says the influencer is a problem maybe we got to join them and push push marad um yep. you know if joe rogan starts calling we need a maritime director Pete, pete's gonna have to answer yep well and i, and I think i think again I, I think one of the things we need to look at or, or is especially in the case of the zim kingston is this is a precursor i mean this is your warning this is the the shot across the bow of what can go wrong off the coast. I mean, we already had it with MSC Dinah, uh, uh, Dinah, you know, dragging the anchor. 
you know, and, and again, if that ship can drag its anchor across a pipeline, it can drag its anchor ashore. I mean, it can it can be, you know, go ashore. And we already had this again with N- we had it NYK. We years ago with Pasha Bulker. Right. You know, and we've had it with NYK Daedalus. We've had it with President Eisenhower off the coast. We've already seen the warnings when 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 the Waukesha or the Express Pearl happens off the West Coast of the United States and you get Exxon Valdez, not off, not off Alaska, but off Southern California. You can't sit there. Nobody can sit there and say, wow, we did not see this coming. And because, you know, one of the things that Ross Kennedy would tell you and Ryan Peterson and you and Craig Fuller and all these guys would, would, would tell you is we all saw this coming, but nobody listened to us. And, you know, everybody saw once COVID hit that, OK, this is what's going to happen. We, we know what's going to start to change right now because we've seen the indications of this for a long time. Uh, John, I want to appreciate you coming on and, and, and taking some time to talk with us. Uh, again, I recommend everybody go to G Captain, uh, get your subscription. Uh, they have a newsletter that comes out every day that you can subscribe to. You can get it right in your email box. It's all free. Uh, it's all free. Uh, it, it's fantastic to go there and everything. Uh, Mike Schiller, fantastic all the time and everything. John Conrad, not as fantastic as Mike Schiller, but still a great guy to, to follow and listen to. Uh, take a look. Uh, again, and, and one of the things I, I would tell you to do in, in G Captain is use those archives. Go in there, look at some past stories. You know, uh, uh, Mike did a great retrospective on container ship issues uh, in the past. John runs a great forum where a lot of people talk in the industry on current topics. You can really, you know, hear from people on the deck plate in the offices. Uh, you, you can get that firsthand perspective, which is just so important to hear. One of the things that I've absolutely loved about doing this YouTube channel is I get comments from truck drivers, from shippers, from people in the industry who sit there and say, Sal, you're right on, or Sal, you're a little bit off. This is what you need to do. And I love that. that to me, I love, you know, if I'm wrong on something, I love to have somebody come out and sit there and say, this is exactly what you need to do. And I think the biggest thing is getting this into the, the hands and, and the, the, the eyes of people, not just in the administration, but common people, you know, hey, why is it my Ikea or my Home Depot doesn't have enough stuff on the shelves? What's the reason behind that? And get the straight Joe, story. Joe Rogan, love you, man. Get Sal on. <laughs> John, I appreciate it. I'm sure I'll have you back on again because I have a feeling that the, the news regarding the maritime industry has not stopped. No. Well, until our next episode, this is Sal and John signing off. Thank you. <laughs>